Merry Christmas and welcome to Pathway Online. We're so glad you can be with us today. As we come together to celebrate the birth of Jesus, let us join the great company of heavenly hosts and sing glory to God in the highest heaven. For today in the town of David, a Savior has been born and He is worthy of all our praise.
Will you sing with us? It came upon the midnight clear. It came upon the midnight clear. That glorious song of old. From angels bending near the earth to touch their harps of gold. Peace on the earth, goodwill to men from heaven's all gracious King. The world in solemn stillness lay to hear the angels sing. And he beneath life's crushing load, whose forms are Hello again, and thank you for joining us for this special Christmas service. My name is Ben, and it's so good to be with you. Now, before we return to our celebration, I've got one question and a special invitation to share with you. If you're the parent of school-aged children, does it seem like our culture is spiraling out of control at times? Well, if you've been wondering how to raise your kids in today's confusing society, we encourage you to join us for our annual Family Discipleship Conference on Saturday, January 13th. This event will be filled with plenty of opportunities to learn, to connect with other parents, and to support one another as we point our kids to Jesus. You can register now on our website or call our church office to learn more. And if you're newer to Pathway, can we treat you to a free lunch? Our next Newcomers Luncheon will take place after the 1045 service on Sunday, January 21st, and we'd love to see you there. During our brief time together, you can enjoy a meal on us, get to know our ministry leaders, and share how you, you'd like to plug in at our church. Just call our office to let us know that you'll be coming. Okay, let's once again prepare our hearts as we continue to worship our Heavenly Father. Thank you so much for being here. Like I said, we're going to continue to sing and celebrate. Before we do, though, I want to give an opportunity for our kids to be a part of our time here together. I would like to sing a song with them. So if you are a, a small child and if you're coming down here and, and you're an adult acting like a small child, I'm going to push you back. I only want kids to come down here. We're going to sing together. So if you are, a, I know there's two, two guys right here. You, you should come and join me. I, I need some friends. I do not want to sit on these steps by myself. So please come and join me. Yes, yes, come, come sit, come sit with us. Yeah, right here, right here. Come on, guys, come on. Kids remind us why Christmas is a time to have joy and a time to celebrate. Kids remind us that... Uh, that gifts are important, right? That gifts matter. Do you know what you're going to get for Christmas? Yes. You do? What are you going to get for Christmas? What do you want for Christmas? A stuffy. A stuffy? Oh, no, those are fun. Oh, come join me. Oh, yes. Love this. 
I love your coat. You look so pretty. Do you know what you want for Christmas? A toys. Toys, yes. Toys, any toys will do. Thank you. What's that? What did she say? I thought she's. Uh, I thought she said corn, but I like unicorn. Unicorn? Okay, unicorn. All right. I could do corn. I could get corn. Well, we want to. We want to sing a song together. I think we, you might know this carol. Can we sing us uh, away in a manger together? Can you do that? Thank you so much. All right, and you guys can join in as well. Let's sing this. Away in a manger, no crib for a bed. The little Lord Jesus lay down his sweet head. The stars in the bright sky look down where he lay. The little Lord Jesus asleep on the I think you're going to notice that as we sing this song, there's going to be some words and some verses that are maybe a little new to you, and that's for our good. That's going to keep us on our toes, right? We can sing a song like this, and it kind of just kind of wash through our, wash through over us and all that, and we kind of don't know what we're singing. We just sing the words, but this this forces us to think about what we're singing. So let's keep going, all right? The actually the words that you are familiar with. So no surprises here. You're in luck. All right? Be near me, Lord Jesus. Here we go. Be near me, Lord Jesus, I ask thee to stay close by me forever and love me, I pray. Bless all the dear children tender care and fit us for heaven to live with thee there. Kids, great job. Can you give yourselves a hand? Good job. Well, before, before you go back to your seats, we're going to pray together. Miss Camille is going to say a prayer. So let's bow our heads and we're going to pray. Good and gracious God, on this holy night you gave us your son, the Lord of the universe, wrapped in swaddling clothes, the savior of all lying in a manger. On this holy night, Father God, would you draw us into the mystery of your love. Join our voices with the heavenly host that we may sing of your glory on high, O Lord Jesus. Give us a place among the shepherds that we may find the one for whom we have waited, Jesus Christ, the Messiah and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, kids. You can go back to your seats. who are too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore, he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. 
and he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. Would you stand and sing with us? seated.
We are reading from Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son and he called his name Jesus. Sing, ah, sing, ah. 
Would you stand and sing with us? Children weep no more Hope is on the horizon We world we Your promised Messiah Angels let your soul You may be seated. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Feliz Navidad. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, y'all. Merry Christmas, Pathway Church. On behalf of our Global Living Water staff and families, we extend our heartfelt gratitude to you. Your unwavering support and dedication to quenching the thirst of those in need has brought lasting transformation to future generations. As we gather in this sacred season to reflect on the birth of our Savior and the transformative gift He gave us, we also celebrate you. Your generosity has brought joy and relief to countless lives through the gift of safe water, sanitation, and hygiene and you have helped create a healthier, brighter future infused with the living water of Jesus Christ because of your compassion and support. Thank you for being a source of hope and love in the lives of so many thirsty children, women, and men. May the abundant peace and boundless love of Christ fill your homes and hearts 
this holiday season. Well, Merry Christmas, everybody. It is good to see you, good to welcome you, and good to have this time together as we celebrate Jesus come to earth. And we're also celebrating, as you just heard on that video, the gift of clean water that we have been giving over the course of the last dozen years or so. And we're excited about the impact that that has made. Now, that was a bit of a uh, thank you from the president there of Living Water International, which is the organization that we have partnered with over that time. And uh, I came into some numbers that I thought actually might interest you. Over the course of this last decade or just over, Pathway Church has given in excess of $717,000 toward clean water in various places around the globe. You have put in 154 wells assisting over 61,000 people, giving them clean water where they have not had clean water in the past. That's what you have done. That's about the population, 61,000, that's like Asheville, North Carolina, or Portland, Maine. Imagine providing clean water for all those people and the impact that it has had in their lives. And I just want to say thank you, add my thank you to the one that you've already heard there on the screen for your generosity. And we're doing that again this year because the need continues to be great and we're going to continue to press into that, to take clean water around the world this year to India and to take the living water, the gospel right along with it, sanitation and hygiene education, and it's making a difference. And I know this is your heart because you've jumped on board year after year after year. Already in a couple of weeks, there's been about 15,000 that's been given toward this project. We just want to escalate that number way up beyond that so that we might be able to provide more and more wells in this year to come. Again, in northern India in this year. I think most of you are already familiar with this project. Some of you are not. And uh, if you'd like to find more information, there is a table out in the lobby you can stop at after the service inside of your Pathway Notes today. You'll also see this flyer which can tell you additional information about this project. Also out at the table, there are some of these greeting cards. This is for you if you might have that difficult person to buy for it. You're getting down there to the wire, by the way, if you don't have all of those gifts purchased. And uh, this would be something, maybe you have someone you know that this would be something that would touch their heart to be a part of. And you can get one of these greeting cards, give a gift in their honor, send this to them. It tells a little bit about what the project is, and you can add your personal greeting to that. That's available to you out in the lobby at the table. However, this would uh, best fit into your Christmas. Be prayerful about how you might respond, and we would love to have you partnering together with that. But again, welcome to all of you. I'm Jeff. I'm one of the pastors here, and it's my privilege to take us into some scriptures together with one another. Before I do that, I have one other announcement to make to you, and that is we have a new sermon series that is coming up in January. We have a couple of weeks coming where we're going to be doing some different things, but then then a few weeks from now, we're going to kick off a new sermon series, which is going to take us through the book of Revelation. Revelation. Very much looking forward to that. This is going to be an important time for us as a congregation. Looking forward to digging into this. Now, as you think of Revelation, all of us maybe think of something just a little bit different. Maybe some of the blessing that it talks about, some of the future that it is talking about. Maybe apocalypse is where your mind goes. Maybe to the second coming. Maybe to tribulation or beasts and dragons. And, and uh, we might come at it from different places. And because of all of that, Revelation Revelation sometimes can be something that is sort of blocked off to us. It can be kind of intimidating. It can be difficult to understand for sure. And for, for many, it's kind of led to neglect of this book. But there's so much to be found here that is so very helpful. It's not just some crystal ball. It is a discipleship journal for us to understand how we might find blessing. If that, that's just how the book kicks off. It talks about the blessing that can be found for the one who reads these things and looks. And I'm looking forward to it, and uh, I hope that you are too. You might have some other people in your life that you think, yeah, this is right up their alley. They would love to be there for that. Again, kicking off in a few weeks. More details about that coming up. But I just wanted to highlight the fact that that's where we'll be going <clears throat> uh, down the road here in just a few weeks. A number of years ago, <clears throat> I had the opportunity to go and attend a golf tournament 
that uh, Jack Nicholas was playing in, and he was in his prime at that time, and he was kind of my golf hero, hero at that time, and so I wanted to go and see him play, and he was number one in the world at that time also, and so <clears throat> I just had this perception of what he would be like <clears throat> there on the golf course. It would be aloof. He'd be he'd standoffish. He wouldn't be someone that you could ever approach. He'd be very serious about his golf game and all of those sorts of things. And so I'm standing on one of the tee boxes there, and I'm right up against the ropes. And he comes up onto the tee box, and uh, I'm just kind of watching him. And the lady next to me yells out, I love you, Jack. And he turns, and he looks. And he looked at me. <laughs> and I'm like, hold on a second. He walked over. He reached out his hand to me. He shook my hand. And I'm like, no, 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 it wasn't me. It was her. And she said, can I have a picture with you? And I said, I, I didn't say it. I thought, there's no way. I mean, why, why, lady, come on. He's in the middle of a golf tournament. And he said, sure. And so she starts fumbling around inside of her purse for her Instamatic camera. Now, for those of you who are under 30, there used to be a time where you had a phone and you had another thing called a camera. There were two separate things. And the phone, by the way, was on your wall at home. That's where it stayed all of that time. I know that might be news to some of you, but uh, there you have it. That's the way that it used to be. Well, well, he said, sure, I'll do that. And so she starts fumbling around in her purse for this camera. She cannot find it. And so I'm thinking he's going to just walk off here, but she keeps digging and he keeps staying put. Now, an Instamatic, for those of you who don't know, is like this old cheap, cheap camera. And it basically made out of plastic, and you had either 12 or 24 shots that you could take. Some of you are nodding your head. You remember all of this. And uh, then as soon as you were out of that number, you had to send the whole thing in to the processing company, and they would throw away the camera, and they would print out your prints and send them to you in three or four years. <laughs> it, it seemed like it took forever to get those prints back. Well, finally, this woman finds her Instamatic camera inside of her purse, and the guy she got to take the picture was setting up, and he, Jack leaned in, and she went to click the, but there were, it was all out. So I figured, okay, this is the moment when Jack is going to make his excuse, and he's going to walk off, but he doesn't. She says, hold on, hold on a second, Mr. Nicholas. I have another camera in my purse. And so she's digging for it, and he's just standing there patiently. He's talking to the people who are around, and finally she finds it, and they click it, and they get the picture, and uh, he goes off to hit his tee shot. And I stood there, and I thought, well, this is really interesting. When, when I went to that tournament, I assumed that I was going to encounter a person who was aloof, he was standoffish, who wouldn't want anything to do with you, he'd pretty much ignore you, he's number one in the world, he didn't need you, all of that sort of thing. What I encountered when I actually got there was something very different than that. It kind of blew my mind to see the way that he was interacting and responding to people, at least in this particular tournament. And what it showed me is that I came with certain preconceived ideas, but he kind of blew those out of the water. But in order for me to recognize that his mindset, his heart was different from that, at least in this tournament, I had to be there with him face to face. I had to be there to, to see it for myself, to have him right there in front of me. Well, here's the thing. Christmas is Jesus choosing to be right in front of us, to come right into our midst so that we might understand a little bit more about who Jesus really is. Because we can come at it very much the same way, having preconceived ideas about who Jesus is, or about what his nature is, or about how he might interact or respond to us, and it might be very different from that. And so for just a few minutes, I want to talk to you about this idea that God wants to be known. God wants to be known. Sometimes you'll hear somebody say that, well, I went looking for God, but I couldn't find him. And I understand when people say that, kind of what they are getting at and driving at. Maybe that is you here today. You might find God to be elusive. You might find God to be different. And I don't want to presume on, on your particular situation, but I know that for me, when I find myself in that sort of a situation where God's feeling elusive, it's actually kind of back to this Nicholas situation. When I find him elusive, it's because I'm looking for him to come to me in a certain way. I have already made up my mind about what he is going to be or what he should be. And so I come at it with that perspective. 
And so if he doesn't respond to me in the way that I'm anticipating that he will, or the way that I want him to, I might very well miss altogether the fact that he was speaking. It's just he wasn't speaking into the box I was trying to put him into. He was trying to take me somewhere else in some different understanding. And sometimes I do believe that that's why we might think I'm searching for God, but I'm only searching for God if he's going to answer me the way that I want an answer. If he's going to lead me the way that I want to be led, as long as he falls into my preconceived ideas. Seems clear that God knew that we'd have some of these preconceived ideas that weren't all that accurate. So he came into our world so that he might give us a clearer picture because he wants to be known. So it only makes sense that if we're going to find the real Jesus, we're going to have to be willing to recognize him as he introduces himself. If you really want to find Jesus, that we would be willing to acknowledge that there is something that he is trying to communicate to us, not just that I'll find him as long as he fits into my preconceived ideas. Very important for us to understand this just right from the get-go. When it comes to making an introduction, Jesus went to great lengths, so much so that he actually came into our world. He came down to earth. There are some specific things that he came to accomplish in the process of becoming better known to mankind. I just want to point out two of these to you, and then we'll be done. First thing that we learn as Jesus enters our world is that he came to enter our experience. He came to enter our experience. The first real indication that Jesus would be physically coming into our world, born of the virgin, was when the prophet Isaiah speaks to that fact in his prophecy that was spoken about 700 years before it actually would come to pass. And then Matthew records it for us in Matthew chapter 1. That say to us these words, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. That description is a declaration that Jesus was not just any other baby. He wasn't just some kid named Emmanuel. He wasn't just Mary's son. He is God with us. God with us. Nobody was trying to pull a fast one when Jesus arrived. It's ordained by God. It's predicted by Isaiah. It's acknowledged by Matthew. It's declared by the angels. It's celebrated throughout the New Testament in hearts ever since. John in his gospel takes God with us another step. When we read in chapter 1 and verse 14 of John's gospel, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Now as John uses that terminology there, he talks about Jesus and then he talks about the word. Sometimes that can be confusing. Well, they can be used interchangeably. They're synonyms. When he says that the word came, he's saying that Jesus came. And I know that might sound a little bit confusing, but it's, it's really not that hard to understand because when you think about the written word of God, what this is is the revelation of God himself. So when you think about Jesus as the word, that is also just saying that he is the revelation of God. As he comes into our world, he wants to be known. He wants to help us to understand what God is like and who he is. It's the same thing he's talking about. He says that the word became flesh. That is, not only did he enter our world, he entered our world in a body, in flesh, just like we are, with all of the weaknesses, with all of the limitations that come along with it. That means that when you fall short, Jesus, get this, Jesus understands where you're coming from. When you sin, when you fall short, Jesus understands where you're coming from because he felt the pull too, just like you have. The Apostle Paul says he was tempted in every way, just as we are, which meant he felt the pull. Did he give in? No. He stopped short of actually giving in, but he can identify, he can understand where you are and what you are experiencing. Remember, he came to enter our experience. So instead of picturing Jesus as being one up in heaven who's just shaking his finger at you, tisk tisk tisk, 
Look on him instead as one who can empathize with your weakness, can empathize with who you are, where you've been, the fact that you gave in, understanding where you've come from, and entering in so that he might come alongside us, so that he might help us to recognize the temptation that is coming and recognize the fact that he has made a way past it, over it, beyond it, and given us the power to overcome. When you do those things that you know you shouldn't do, your first inclination is probably to turn and run from God, to go the other way because of the embarrassment you feel, because you immediately feel out of step with him. So it's like, I just need some distance. And that's exactly the worst thing to do, just the opposite of what we should, because Jesus understands. He knows. He came into our world to meet us in our sin, so that when we're there, we ought to run to him because he came to help us to provide a way beyond it and over it. So important for us to understand. And that's what sets Christianity apart from every other religion, every other one, because nowhere else do you find the creator entering into creation to rescue it. It just doesn't happen. There's no other religion that says so. So when people come to you and they say, yeah, every religion's pretty much the same. Say, no, it's not. It's not even close to the same. Talk about Jesus who entered into his own creation to rescue. The message of all other religions is you better work really hard because God is pointing you out with his finger and he's mad at you and you'd better do better, and if you do well enough, then he, your God, your created, your, your supreme being, might just give you the opportunity to overcome and make it into whatever eternal blessedness that there is. Christianity is the only place where the Savior enters in, and he did. He came to enter into our experience. That's the first thing. And also, secondly, he came to show his nature the things a person does tells you a lot about their nature, their character. You just have to look at what they do. It's like, okay, I, under, I learned something about you. <laughs> Pittsburgh is uh, kind of in this hubbub right now about, uh, at least the Steelers fans are, about a certain wide receiver. Some of you know what I'm talking about. George Pickens, who last weekend refused to block on a play that possibly could have led to a score for Jalen Warren, but he refused to and later pointed out the fact that the reason that he didn't do that block or hold on to that block was because he was afraid he was going to get injured if he did. You can imagine how this is going over with Steelers fans, with many of you, of course. And so people are saying, see, that reveals who he is. He's just some narcissistic player, and we ought to bench him or trade him, right? That's what you've been hearing, because we know who he is because of the way he acts. At least that's the way that people are seeing it. Or you can identify things about your own nature and character based on the way that you respond in situations, all kinds of situations, including how you handle your email. Maybe you didn't know this. According to experts, if you're a person who meticulously writes your emails and reviews them several times before you send them off, making sure there's no typos in them at all, they say what it tells about you is that you are very conscientious and a bit OCD, all right, if that's you. And you know who you are. If you're a person who writes very lengthy emails and then sends them off, the experts tell us that tells us something also that you are very thorough and also that you're a needy person. I'm not sure exactly how they make that connection. And if you're a person who writes very, very lengthy emails and you go back and review them over and over, I'm not quite sure what that says about you, but it can't be good. <laughs> the experts also say if you file or delete emails as soon as you receive them, you probably have a great need to be in control or need greater, more order in your life. And finally, they also say if, uh, if you let emails pile up and don't answer them, you're just annoying. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Actually, the experts don't say that. All the rest of us say that. So will you please just answer your email? All right. You can tell something about people based on how they act in any of a number of situations. And the same thing is true with God. You can understand a lot about God as you look on how Jesus acted, what he did when he came into our world, when he came down to earth. It tells us a lot. He didn't want us to just build our life on guesses and assumptions and presumptions and wondering what he is. That's another problem with many other world religions is that you really don't know who this God is. Or you make some assumptions and you really don't have any sort of a personal connection. Jesus came into our world to be known so that we might know who he is. So what do we learn about God with us? Well, for one thing, when he comes down, we can learn that God with us is also love with us because the scriptures are replete with circumstances and, and verses and, and situations where we see God's love on display. Uh, Galatians chapter 2, we read, the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's the ultimate reason that he came. Jesus came as love with us. He also comes as compassion with us. Matthew writes about Jesus. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus is here. People are seeing how he acts. They know he's loving. They know that he is compassionate. Jesus was also a servant with us. Mark says in his gospel, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. On top of that, Jesus was patient with us, knowing about our our frailties. Peter chimes in saying, instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. We could go on and on with Jesus' mercy, with his forgiveness, with his grace, with his truth, with his humility, with his kindness, and more and more and more. How do we know those things? Because he came so that he might be known so that we might understand something about his nature and his character, and we see it in the way that he engages, in the way that he acts. You cannot reliably draw conclusions about Jesus from a distance. You need to draw near. But for some of us, that's exactly what we've been doing. We've been drawing conclusions from a distance. And the conclusions we draw can't be all that accurate. You might have drawn conclusions that Jesus is uncaring because you've had some difficult circumstances and he hasn't bailed you out. You might have drawn some conclusions that Jesus is cruel because he hasn't done anything about a difficult situation that you or a loved one is in. You might have drawn conclusions that he's aloof because you just can't seem to find him or feel him to be there. I get how you could come to those conclusions or feelings and want him to make a move, but the fact is that he's already made a move. He's already drawn near so that we might find him and experience his goodness and experience his love. The challenge comes when we were only willing to see him or can only recognize him when he acts or reacts or responds in a way that fits into our box. And we can keep pushing that button. We can keep insisting on that's who he would be in our life. What's going to happen is we're going to continue to miss him. And we're going to end up pursuing something is going to lead us, maybe if we get our way, to something that is not even beneficial for us. And that's how many of us have pushed. And so my challenge is that we would respond to Jesus acknowledging that he's already made a move toward you insisting, or instead of insisting that he'd make another or instead of insisting that he would fall into conforming to your will. And as you do so, I'm confident that what you will find is that he's been reaching out all along. He's been reaching to you, but you've been pushing it away because you want something else which ultimately we need to understand is not that which is in God's best interest for us. Jesus came down to earth so that God could be known. And that's what he longs for us, that we would know him better. 
Bow your heads with me. Friend, I'm not sure where you would find yourself today, but the fact of the matter is Jesus is reaching to you. And instead of insisting that he would conform to your will, would you be willing to open your mind and your heart to the idea that he longs to lead you to his very best for you? But it's just going to require that we would conform to his will, his will which in his sovereignty we can acknowledge is the very best thing for us, that you might release the insistence that you would be guiding your life and that hopefully God might bless your plan, but you'd fall into his plan for you. Maybe you're here and you're one who would say, you know, I've never really taken any step toward God. Maybe at some point I was like, yeah, if you're there, show me, but we really weren't genuinely looking. Now was an opportunity knowing, understanding that he's reaching to you to reach back to him to find him, to take you by the hand, to lead you into his very best for you, to lead you into life and victory over sin and forgiveness. That's what I would long for you. You can do that just by acknowledging that God is who he says he is, that he came into our world, yes, down to earth to be born, ultimately to go to a cross, so that he might take our sin out of the way, recognizing that he knows where we've been. When we fall into sin, he understands because we've been there. It doesn't mean it's right. It doesn't mean it doesn't need to be forgiven and confessed. And in these moments, I just invite you to confess, to draw yourself toward God. Ask him to draw near to you. Maybe praying a prayer, something like this, Dear God, yes, I've walked away from you. Yes, I've tried to insist that my way would be the only way, and I've even desired that you might endorse that. But today, I want to live according to your purpose and your will, so I'm submitting to you, asking you to be Lord of my life. Friend, that's all that's is all that needed, just a heart that desires to walk closely with God and seek his forgiveness and putting our trust in him. And if you've done that, I'd love to talk to you after this service about that decision and how to take next steps forward. Lord, thank you so much for your presence with us through Jesus. Come into our world, born that he might die, born that we might have life. We celebrate that he wanted to be known, not for his fame, but for our eternal life. We thank you for it and respond to it now in his precious name, the name of Jesus, God with us. Amen.
Luke 2, verse 8 through 14. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart, and the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told. sing this together.
Silent night. Silent night. Holy night. Son of God. Love's pure light. Radiant beams from thy holy face. With God, we thank you that we can gather in this place and worship your name. Worship you, God. Thank you for being Emmanuel, God, with us. I pray that you would go before us now. May we be a people who seek your will, who follow after you, our shepherd and our king. We thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for being here. Have a great Christmas. We'll see you next weekend. Thank you again for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you again soon on campus or right here online. Have a wonderful week and a Merry Christmas, everybody.